Joe Kent has the morning off, but we're delighted to reconnect with Malia Hill of Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. And Malia, I wish you the very happiest of holidays. Merry Christmas, and thank you for joining us. Oh, Merry Christmas. I'm so happy to be here. Could you uh, do us a favor? Would you mind just a, a brief uh, background on yourself to reconnect with our friends who may have not visited with us before? Yes, I'm Malia Hill. I'm the policy director at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Um, I work with Joe Kent, so if you know <laughs> Joe, you kind of know what we do. We uh, are really a voice for um, individual freedom and uh, economic prosperity in Hawaii. And my job is just, you know, looking at these policy issues, trying to help come up with solutions, trying to make this um, less expensive <laughs> for your state to live in. Sure. Understand. And it's a, it's a, a lot of diligence uh, being applied because... Uh, our home, there is something going on every two seconds where their uh, taxpayers and citizens need to be aware of. And it really is something else. Um, there are some topics that we could cover, and I'd like to start off, if you wouldn't mind, because during and post-COVID, our state budget seemed to be about as flush as it could possibly be. And now... Turmoil is a good word to describe our state budget scenario. Malia, what should we know about this? Well, yeah, this is a, a really, really alarming thing because even just at the beginning of the year, we were talking surplus, and then we were talking about, ago, oh, there's a light, smaller surplus than we thought, but it's still good. And then at the end of the legislative session, we were saying the legislature spent the surplus. Um, and we even, you know, when Governor Green sort of cut some of that, you know, we were really praising him. Now, all of a sudden, that surplus has disappeared, um, as far as as far as anyone can tell. The Council of Revenues is looking at um, lower tax revenues. Basically, you know, you can tell if the economy is not doing, you know, fantastic. If the economy is flat, revenue tax revenues are going to be flat. So revenues are just sort of flat and steady, but that spending just goes up and up and up. So what we're basically looking at is that what little surplus there is is supposed to carry us through the next couple of years um, before they, they just sort of magically, all of a sudden, everything is going to get better in, you know, starting around 2026 or so. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, revenues will go up and the budget will go down according to the general fund financial plan that the government put out. Um, if you believe that, I have uh, land to sell you. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. you know, we are in danger of basically operating at a deficit. If it weren't for the surplus, we would be. that. It's just kind of gone away. The expenditures have gone way up, you know, and the revenues are, tax revenues are flat along with the economy. And on top of that, we're, the state is, you know, selling a $750 million in bonds. So basically they are borrowing um, taking on more debt with the highest interest rates in yeah. two decades. Yep. So, and that's that's money that has to be paid back eventually. You know, there's going to be those in powers of authority that will say, you know, the reason why is the tragic consequence of the Maui wildfires and the necessity to recover, invest, and insure. And... Malia, help us understand, first of all, if that is invoked, what role the Maui wildfires play in our state budget. But it is, you just mentioned, that bond float, oh my goodness, the repayment of it, ridiculous. But are there particular expenditures that the state has either made or committed to that has erased this budget for us? Yeah, that's a little bit gray because there's also relief money in it. So, you know, we know that there's been, um, you know, the SBA has seen about $260 million approved in disaster assistance loans. We know that the governor has been talking about a lawsuit fund, um, mm -hmm. and we don't really see where, how that's going to work into the budget. Um, we know that they've put out um, about... Uh, $250 million in the budget for um, relief and recovery. 
So some of this is, you know, some of this money is necessary, and that is, you know, one of the reasons for the expenditures. But that's not, and, and to some degree, that's one of the reasons for low tax revenues because uh, anything that, you know, economically affects the state, economically, you know, affects the tax revenues. But it's not the only reason. You can't just point to Lahaina and say, oh, well, that's why. You know, these are problems that existed before. I mean, these are problems that go back years and years and years. It's interesting because we hear about the stadium uh, project, entertainment uh, development project, the Appropriations Department of Hawaiian Homelands. There's still an ongoing uh, scenario with, um, I know it's not directly, but revenues in regard to rail that have state implications. So we've had big major expenditures. It's the small ones we don't get reports on from either government or the recipients. I'm really curious at 50 million here, 120 million here, 12 million there. The disbursements of funds out of this state have got to be just remarkable that don't show up on a major uh, budget report out of a particular department. Yeah, that's one of the things, you know, you, you really nailed it. I mean, it's one thing just to look at the, you know, the big budget numbers, but there's all this, you know, all these little details like special funds. And mm-hmm. even the auditor has been after the state to fix these, you know, little special fund here, a little special fund there because of how, how it can just turn into a fiscal nightmare after a while, but it's still, it's just an ongoing practice, you know, 20 million here, 12 million here. And that does add up over time. Mm -hmm. And that's not even getting into the debt service and the issues with the, um, the liability, the unfunded liabilities, healthcare and pension. Yeah. We're talking with uh, Malia Hill. Delighted that, We have time together today. Joe has the morning off. We'll rejoin at a future time. We mentioned Governor and Maui. Governor Green and Mayor Bisson, I'm really struggling with this, to force short-term rentals on Maui to rent long-term. Does the Constitution play a role in this? I mean, it just (laughs) seems, seems a little tough. Yeah, it, it feels a little scapegoating. You know, they they are trying to persuade short-term rental owners to open up and rent long-term to victims of the Lahaina fires. And I think we can all see, you know, okay, that's great. And they're offering, you know, up to 400% of fair market value, you know, $11,000 a month for a four-bedroom home um, if you'll rent for, you know, 18 months. And given that it's currently costing us $13,000 a month to put uh, people in right. hotels, that's a I mean, that's a good deal, (laughs) technically speaking. Um, But, you know, giving incentives, that's great. But you've got to realize there's reasons that people might not be able to rent short term. And so to follow that with this, and if you don't, we will either ban short term rentals or we'll um, one of the things that was talked about was we'll just pass a huge tax hike on any mm-hmm. tax hike on any short-term rentals that don't participate. You know, they're talking 400% property tax hike, things like that, nice. which is, I mean, effectively like a moratorium. And you're right, there are some constitutional issues here. Um, even the governor knows that. He kind of did that whole thing where he says, we don't really want to do that because there might be a lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Um what are short-term rental owners supposed to take from that? Unreal. I, I just, uh, and by the way, sidebar note, is there any way a connection to emergency order authority that can be invoked in these regards? So he may say, well, we'd really like for you to, but under the emergency powers that I have, you're going to do it whether you like it or not. You know, it's, well... The emergency powers of the governor in Hawaii are, at least under the law, extremely expansive. So mm-hmm. they can, he can try to do any number of things, and we've certainly seen uh, governors in Hawaii try to do a lot. But it is important to remember that um, emergency powers do not supersede your constitutional rights. 
you know, they, the courts can kind of look at the, you know, they can give a little benefit of the doubt, especially, you know, in a really short term sort of way. Um, but, you know, your basic fundamental rights, they still exist in an emergency. And the governor isn't supposed to be able to just wipe them away with the stroke of a pen. Um, but that still means that you have to 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 assert them, and that's where it starts to fall apart. Because then, it, you know, you're in the court system. It's not a very speedy way to deal with it. Um, it would be nicer if we would just kind of restrain the emergency powers a little bit, so it wasn't so tempting to use them in these extremely broad ways. It is already uh, eight fifty in the morning. Talking with Malia Hill of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, serving as policy director, and so glad she's with us. I'm going to stay with a bit of property and real estate, and now assessments are before us yet again. I know that we had a cataclysmic uh, 2022 in the assessments that property owners received. Do we have an indication of what's ahead of us, Malia? Well, the good news is it looks like assessments, at least in Honolulu this year, are going to be nothing like they were last year. Last year, we were looking at double-digit um, mm-hmm. increases, um, which, you know, of course, just equates to much higher, higher property taxes. People always say, you know, you have low property taxes in Hawaii. Like, no, that's not true. You have low property tax rates and extremely high property tax values, so you just sort of have average property taxes in Hawaii. Um, the good news is is that the overall um, property taxes are only supposed to go up about less than 1%, 0.79%. Now, that depends on where, you're, where you live. So in some places, you know, the North Shore, for example, they're actually going to go down. Um, mm-hmm. But in some places, like urban Honolulu, they will go up about 5%. Right. So it's not 100% good news, um, but for most people, it's a very small increase um, or even possibly a decrease. So what does that mean for the fiscal health of the city and county? Because the lion's share of revenue is derived from property taxes. If there were any budgets and or projects under last year's revenue stream, and that becomes mitigated and shrinks is there any concern at the county level that we might have some issues well well i don't i guess whether this is good news or not depends on how you feel about how much the county has to work with in terms Mm. of its budget but this should not create a budget crisis it is still an increase which means that they will still have um you know as much or slightly more money to work with than last year even with you know, the the tax relief that they've put okay. into place. Gotcha. Um, and there might even be, one hopes, a little room to kind of stay with those those tax reforms that they've put in place to deal with these rising assessments. So it shouldn't cause a crisis, but that doesn't mean that, you know, they still can't generate, you know, use some restraint, start looking at the budget with, you know, some some fiscal mm-hmm. fiscal responsibility in mind. Gotcha. And in the waning moments we have together with Malia, uh, 2024, it's upon us. It's about 10 minutes away. Um, what, do you, what does Grassroot hope to accomplish in this upcoming legislative session? Well, we have really high hopes this year. Um, there's a lot we want to do. Now, Obviously, one of our big things is we're always out there trying to prevent taxes from going up, trying to get the keep the state from getting even more costly to live in. So that's always part of what we do. But there are some things that we're trying to move forward uh, with housing. We have a bunch of bills that we're looking at that would sort of help spur more housing growth, um, especially affordable housing. But when I say that, I don't mean just things that are considered affordable housing by, you know, state laws that mm-hmm. do that kind of thing, but really just housing that people can afford yeah. <laughs> uh, just across the board. So we have, you know, suggestions about being able to create starter homes with smaller lots um, that would be more affordable affordable for people. Um, we are looking at um, a yes in God's backyard bill, which mm-hmm. would help 
people um, allow nonprofits like churches and schools and such to build on their land by right. Uh, we also want to see more health care compacts. You know, we passed the uh, Physicians Health Care Pact compact last year and you know we're looking at how can we expand that and expand it to nurses and psychologists and other other professions other medical professions and uh, of course we like to get involved in consumer protection issues um, we're hoping to see a bill that addresses certificate of need a bill that addresses the degree requirements or unnecessary degree requirements in um, government hiring but we're looking at a cottage food bill um, to help small small businesses be able to sell their goods. And um, it's worth noting that the cryptocurrency sandbox is going to end this year. So, you know, we will be advocating for a very uh, crypto-friendly, uh, innovation-friendly solution that still protects consumers. There's a lot on the agenda for the new year. And Malia can thank you enough for joining us. And we wish you all the very, very best during the holiday season. And once again, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Well, thank you very much. Merry Christmas to you all as well. Thank you. Aloha, Malia. And thanking Malia Hill very, very much indeed. <laughs>